Hey everyone, uh, my name is Phil Hagen. I'm the course lead and uh, certified instructor with the SANS Institute. I'm the course lead for Forensics 572. It's our advanced network forensics and analysis class. I'm going to talk to you just briefly here now uh, in this video about how we deliver the course through this SANS VLive platform. And SANS, as you may know, has a number of different formats uh, that we use to distribute our courseware. And uh, it's because we want to make sure we're, we're providing value to the maximum number of students. A lot of students have different budgetary requirements, different uh, ways that they prefer to learn, for example. Uh, we want to make sure that we're delivering it in the best format for them. And in the VLive format, we have two sessions per week uh, over the course of six weeks. And those three-hour sessions, each one, uh, you know, we have the entire course delivered across that extended amount of time. It gives you the ability to absorb it more and kind of work on your own schedule. I'll talk a little bit about more on that, more about that in just a moment. Uh, but I'll also want to talk to you about uh, specifically Forensics 572, a little bit about the overview of the course, and uh, and then a couple of tips and tricks that I've picked up over the years delivering material through VLive that really make it an enjoyable experience for uh, for our students. Now, in terms of VLive itself. You know, telecommuting is great, but uh, we also realize that it's not so much fun to take a course just by, uh, you know, watching a screencast and then listening to an instructor over the audio. So we like to use the webcam whenever we possibly can. Hey, how's it going? So uh, here I am sitting in uh, in my home office back in uh, in the great state of Delaware, and uh, we're able to teach to people all over the place. So wherever you might be globally, uh, you know, we're able to give you the same class material. Uh, with all the same instructors and, and really want to deliver an excellent, excellent experience for you. Uh, what I also want to say is when we originally wrote Forensics 572, we made sure, engineered from the ground up, that it was going to work in VLive just as well as any other mechanism. So you're really getting the exact same course. We don't have to cut any corners whatsoever. The other benefit that you get that uh, really is, is a, a fun one for a lot of folks is that you get access to the recordings of your session not just the, you know, the the uh, you know someone else's session, but the exact session that you were in um, with the rest of the the virtual classmates for six months, and that is excellent because that is a tremendous tool for if you're going on the uh, down the path of the GX certification with the GNFA. Uh, certainly, it gives you the ability to circle back and uh, brush up on extra materials or go back on something you may have forgotten or. Or uh, you know, just maybe you've got life that gets in the way. Maybe you've got a, a son or a daughter with some kind of a school event that prevents you from taking the, sitting in one of the classes live during the, the overall course session. Um, you're able to go back on that on your own schedule, which is uh, is certainly a very nice benefit. In addition, the convenience is huge. Um, you know, there are no travel costs, which is excellent. We realize that budgets are sometimes at a premium uh, in this day and age, and you're able to take this uh, without needing to pay for the airfare or and then the hotel and the per diem and things like that that often make uh, you know the supervisors uh, a little bit itchy on not wanting to pay for uh, for the training costs. And as I mentioned, it's on your own schedule and at your own pace. You can circle back on that material through those recordings um, you know, and, and really learn at your own pace. Uh, you want to take a little bit of extra time on the labs? No problem at all. Those recordings will be there waiting for you again for that six-month period. In addition, and, and this is kind of funny because this is the number one question that I get on uh, day one of any of our recording sessions and any of our uh, course sessions, is there a coin for this class? Well, there absolutely is a coin. It's a, uh, it's a virtual class with a real lethal forensicator coin. Um, if you're not familiar with a lot of our forensics courses in the curriculum, we like to uh, uh, have a day, uh, our, in day six or week six capstone exercise. That's just a very long, very involved um, type of uh, uh, an exercise. And at the end of that capstone exercise, uh, students present their findings and then we judge who had the best best presentation, the most findings. And uh, if you win that, then you get listed on the SANS Lethal Forensicator page, and we will snail mail you anywhere in the world your very own SANS Lethal Forensicator coin. Really, really cool. Virtual class, real coin. In addition, one other thing about the capstone is you do get an extended amount of time to work on that with your teammates in the VLive format. So uh, we'll actually give you almost an entire week to work on that, which uh, gives a lot of VLive students and some extra time to really get into that evidence and, uh, and find a lot of really cool, cool artifacts. 
So looking at uh, Forensics 572 specifically, just a little bit on the overall DFIR curriculum. Um, you know, we've, we've, this is a 500 level course. Uh, so let's see if you can see my, uh, my cursor here. Uh, we do expect folks to come in with a fundamental level of understanding on things like forensic processing and best practices and hypothesis development. Um, as with all of our for, uh, 500 level classes that we've got in the forensic curriculum, uh, we do rely very heavily on the uh, Linux command line, so uh, you know we'll get you up to speed if, if that's not uh, something that you have familiarity with, uh, but that is something we're going to rely on very heavily throughout the course, but folks really love it because that's really where the rubber meets the road. But where we sit is down in the incident hunt, uh, response and the adversary hunting uh, tier. So this is going to be taking all the things that folks know about forensic processing and case handling and case management and bringing in network forensics, bringing in network evidence. Now we're going to talk about uh, augmenting or, or just uh, you know sole looking at uh, network evidence including uh, log-based evidence, which is going to include what we refer to as artifacts of communication. Uh, we're also going to bring in NetFlow information as well as PCAP, so three primary sources of evidence that we talk about. And we've got the overall course broken up into six general sections, and those are split out by week. And we start off uh, not with introduction. This is, again, a 500-level class, so there are no introduction days at SANS. Um, we're going to be transitioning. We're going to be leveling all our students up to a point where uh, you can start uh, hitting the road, you know, maybe with some tools you haven't used in some time, or maybe networking is something that's, you know, you're not too familiar with yet. Well, that, that's all right. We're going to bring you in and, uh, uh, you know, make sure that you're able to understand a lot of the, these artifacts. Again, uh, you know, fundamental understanding is, is going to be important, but we're going to transition folks in to kind of bring these things all together. Now, day two is where we start the hunt. Uh, day two is going to be when you walk into a, a scenario in, in your client or maybe your own environment, you don't know what's there, but you know something's wrong. How do you find that? Well, that's, that's the hunt. Um, a great way to engage in hunt teaming is through the use of NetFlow, because NetFlow usually goes back a long time in terms of its collection. Uh, it's going to be uh, something that you can very efficiently query in order to find anomalous situations that you need to spend more time on and investigate more comprehensively. Then, of course, once you find those incidents, you're going to start to dig in on the protocol side. Now, whether you're talking about log evidence or in the PCAP, understanding how protocols work is absolutely critical because you've got to, again, look for anomalies or look for artifacts that can be used for profiling or artifacts that indicate, uh, you know, maybe how the compromise could have occurred. Now, we're going to hit protocols for two primary different reasons. In some cases, like DNS and HTTP, I expect you're going to see those every single case that crosses your desk. However, in some other cases, they might not be as commonly seen, uh, but let's take uh, FTP, for example. It may not be extremely common. I do see it in casework pretty routinely, um, but certainly not as much as DNS or HTTP. But FTP also gives us the opportunity to learn how to learn protocols. That's going to be very helpful because there are thousands of network protocols that are documented and probably an infinite number that aren't documented because they can be easily customized out. So being able to learn how to learn protocols is going to make sure that you as the investigator are most prepared to address whatever evidence might cross your desk, whether or not that's a protocol you know about or something that's brand new that nobody's ever seen before because maybe your adversary custom built this malware and this, uh, this protocol for use in your environment. Well, as we learn a bit about those protocols, we're going to shift into logging. Now, logging is, is something that's very helpful to us because it helps to establish context around our other observations, and it can also be used as a driver into other sources of evidence. If your logs suggest, for example, that HTTP activity might be of interest, maybe you'd want to go to a proxy server to pull some log information off. Things along those lines. It becomes a very good, like I said, kind of a driver into other evidence sources. We also talk a little bit about how operating in the network domain is absolutely different than operating in a static evidence environment. You may need to actually modify the, uh, the, the crime scene, so to speak, the environment there. Uh, and knowing how to do that in an appropriate way is very, very important. Otherwise, you might compromise your own investigation. Now, in uh, week five, we're going to get into a lot of other topics that could, to be completely honest, be courses unto themselves. Encryption, for example. We're not going to teach you everything you possibly know to become a PhD in, uh, in encryption or cryptanalysis, cryptanalysis, but we are going to give you the basics specifically with an understanding of how you can use them in a network forensic investigation. 
very, very key that we are focusing these topics toward network forensics. Uh, in addition, protocol reverse engineering, absolutely one of my favorite modules that we've got in this course. Um, it's going to show you how to look at undocumented or misused overloaded protocols to find those anomalies and to look at them and be able to say real quickly, this right here, this is the session that's, that's unusual and I need to dig into this event and to know why. We'll give you an idea of what that process looks like. We're also going to round that day out, or that week out uh, by talking about automation because we also recognize that despite the fact we have dozens and hundreds of tools that might be available to us to, in this environment, they're not going to be all encompassing. You may need to build your own or bundle a couple of tools up together. So we're going to talk about some of those and how they fit into the forensic workflow as well. Then comes the capstone. So actually at the end of week five, second session week five, we go ahead, we task out the capstone exercise in VLive, and then at the beginning of session two in week six, we have students present. So you know, we do a down select, we, we uh, choose a couple of the best briefings that students have submitted, and we let students right here on the VLive platform click through their own presentations, give them the virtual microphone, and let them walk through the, uh, uh, the findings they have. Then the class will vote, and uh, we'll have a winner. And then, of course, I've got to hype, uh, hype the coin. We send these out by, uh, by the good old snail mail, so you've got that on your own. List you on the website so the winners have all the fame and glare, glory and accolades associated with being a lethal forensicator. Now, just a little bit about uh, you know, network forensics in general. Why would you need to include this in your, your repertoire of skills in the forensic world? A lot of different reasons. Uh, you know, just in brief, the hard drive might not be available. Now, that might not be the burned out hulk of a system that you see here, of course. I've dealt with that. It's not fun. It may happen, but it's not always going to be the case. But for example, that system might be long gone. Maybe it was, uh, you know, aged out and, and totally replaced and, and the original hard drive was destroyed. Maybe uh, it was a mobile device that uh, wasn't yours. Maybe it was a, a BYOD environment and you don't have the ability to image that, for example. A lot of different reasons that the device storage itself might not be accessible. Suffice to say, network gives you great insight to the, uh, the cir circumstances behind whatever incident you're actually investigating. In addition, the evidence might just be sitting there and waiting for you. Unlike with disk-based forensics where you need to take an image, which, hey, let's face it, a two terabyte hard drive, even if you're dealing with an SSD, it's not going to be the fastest thing in the world. Um, however, in the, uh, um, in the, if the evidence is already sitting there, you can start the process of the image and let the little progress bar start building out. Uh, and then while that's going, hey, pop over to the network team. Start looking at that evidence because that can be a really good vector into the disk-based evidence, looking for timelines or artifact types that you want to seek out. It can actually outline your entire investigation on the disk. Or I even had cases where we got all of our findings out of the network before the server's hard drive image was done being created and then we used the drive to corroborate our findings on the network. It was fantastic to be able to do that, and it really amounted to a faster investigation overall. Other reasons you would want to incorporate network forensics is just one of scale. Uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of endpoints in a common environment means it's really, really difficult to find the five that matter. Which five uh, systems in your environment are responsible for this compromise? We've got to have some means of finding them. And certainly network forensics, going back to the idea of, uh, of hunt teaming and, and scoping, is a great, great way to do that. And then lastly, just going back on the concept of hunt teaming to begin with, uh, if you are one of the forward-thinking organizations that uh, assumes you are breached instead of hopes that you don't find out you're breached, congratulations. My hat is off to you. Uh, I'm not wearing a hat, as you can see by the webcam, but uh, you know that's excellent if you're one of the, uh, the forward-leaning folks that think that way. Assumption of breach needs to become the new norm, and along with that comes the idea that you are hunting the attacker that is already there. Network forensics is a fantastic way to do that because when you get an idea of a baseline of normal activity, you can quickly identify the anomalous actions within your environment that lead you to investigate more completely, dive further in. Something you can do for broad-based and then dive in a little bit closer to, uh, uh, to the root evidence. Now, a couple of things I've picked up over the years. Um, I teach this class a lot, and, and a number of those times are on VLive. 
again, even when we go through and do demonstrations, those also get recorded. So if I'm going to pop over, and I'm going to flip over to my VM here, I've got my SIFT workstation VM that's customized for the Forensics 572 class. And then I'm going to probably type my password wrong, because I usually typo stuff wrong. There we go. So what I've got here is my VM running on my system, showing you why that's uh, showing up here, showing you that I've got a Wireshark loaded up, and I can go ahead and in real time I can say, well, maybe we're looking for HTTP requests that uh, contain the string widgets. Contains. See, it's red. I should have known that. All right, so it contains widgets. Well, I go ahead and apply that out, and you'll see here that I'm, I'm in, interacting in real time, and I can actually walk through this evidence. Now we can use this as a demonstration. We can use this as a means of uh, kind of giving some context to some of the labs, for example. A lot of different ways we can use this, but certainly being able to demonstrate with a VM on my end means you're, you're getting a very, very rich experience overall. In addition, uh, when you are making up those missed sessions, those recordings are really helpful because if, uh, if you're like, man, that demo that we did on passive DNS rendering using the Multigo tool, that was really cool. I want to go back and see that. Well, you've got the recording. You can do that. You can go watch that thing, and you can fast forward and reverse it as much as you need. Some other things that I do um, that I find are very helpful is because we have students who are coming back to these recordings after the fact, um, they are missing out on, on that, that kind of real-time interaction that we often get in a virtual classroom. Therefore, for every single VLive that I personally run, um, I set up a separate Google group. And it's just a, basically a message board that you can sign up for, and I approve everybody in in the first couple of sessions. If you have a question, ask in the group. It's just like kind of raising your hand in class and, and saying, hey, what about X, Y, and Z? Can you tell me about the Moloch tool? What about, you know, how does the ELK stack apply to this? You can ask all those questions in the, in the uh, uh, Google group, and you're asking the question in the virtual classroom, even if the virtual classroom isn't stood up during those two, three hour sessions per week. So if you are going back on the recording, it's a great way to continue to interact with your peers in the class itself. A couple other things that I've kind of got uh, over the years. Um, during the class, we do have a chat session. So we have a little chat log that's up, and uh, students will be able to kind of type a question to me. Hey, can you go back and answer a question a little bit more about this, uh, this topic, or do it, have you ever seen this situation? Um, and, and I'll be able to answer those. Sometimes I answer them in the chat. Usually I'll uh, answer them verbally. I'll say, oh, hey, that's a really good question, Frank. Um, you know, you asked about X, Y, and Z. Uh, you know, this type of uh, artifact maybe, and I can answer that verbally on the voice track. Well, if you're listening on the recording, sometimes you're going to lose some context there. But I give you the PDFs. So before we end each VLive session, I take a PDF copy of all the chat logs, and I make those available to the students as well. So you really do get the ability to go back on both the broadcast kind of a, a video, interactive uh, video component, component as well as the uh, text component as well. And the last thing that I do, and I do this for all classes, um, I have an Evernote notebook where I keep tons of different resources specifically about network forensics. Now, um, if you don't use Evernote, that's cool. You don't have to, to log in or create an account or anything. It's something that you can search and, and use without any account through the web browser, and that's fine. Um, but I put all kinds of resources in here, like uh, new academic papers, maybe, or links to tools that, uh, that might be useful, or updated information um, of uh, the topics that we talk about during the class. And that's something that is, is you know, pretty much perpetual. It's going to last forever. I do modify the contents now and again, so you know, I probably have a couple hundred notes in there at this point, um, and students are able to access that during the class, whether we're in the classroom sessions uh, in real time, during the uh, the VLive event itself over those six weeks, or heck, you know, years later. I have a couple of students that were in this class a year and a half ago. They're still using the Evernote uh, notebook, and they're still getting value out of it. So that's something that we do as well that makes sure that you're getting added information about the class as it becomes available. So that's really what I've got so far. Um, you know, it's a really fun class. Uh, you know, I enjoy teaching it, and I really think that the students get a lot out of it, uh, especially in the VLive scenario for all the uh, 
reasons that we discussed so far. So I hope you have a chance to check it out and uh, see when we're offering it next in VLive. Usually runs at least a couple of times a year. Um, we'd love to have you in the in the event. Uh, you know, I would love to uh, virtually meet you, as it says on screen, and uh, hope that we have a chance to to work together. And uh, please do feel free to contact us either at the SANS addresses or or you can reach out to me on social media. I'll be happy to point you in the right direction, answer any questions that you might have. Thanks very much. I appreciate your time, and uh, once again, hope to see you at one of our events soon. Have a good day. <laughs>